Today's guest is Guy Skinner from Citygate Financial Planning. He is a financial planner and he is a business owner. We talk about his personal journey from losing his father at 10 years old and how that inspires him to work within the financial planning and to position life protection. We talk about the importance of life protection. We talk about his charity work, growing a business and why building a relationship with introducers doesn't need to be that difficult. I hope you enjoy this episode. Guy, thank you so much for joining me today on the Financial Planner Life podcast. How are you? Yeah, I'm well, thank you. How are you, Sam? Not too bad. Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Working through lots of stuff at the moment. It's a bit uh, stressful and a bit tricky in my my work-life balance, but I'm finding the time to work on myself and I'm discovering some really interesting things about me. I always find that when you go and when you're under pressure and you're under stress, you start to recognize those defects of character. They start to come to the surface and you start to look at the things that are perhaps behaviors that you need to change. They become way more obvious when your ass is in the fire. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree with that. A bit of a bit of pressure and your habits are not to the side and yeah. Bad habits come out more, so I suppose, and they can take over. Yeah, precisely. Sure. What do you do to deal with that pressure and stress? You know, other, you're a business owner. If you were to give anybody some advice right now, you seem quite level-headed. We've had a great conversation. You're very driven. You've got that performance um, mindset, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted you on the podcast. We had such an interesting conversation when we were talking about recruiting for your business as well. What do you think other people can do when they're under that immense amount of pressure and stress? What do you do to keep yourself level-headed? Well, I'd love to say that this was always the calm demeanor that I, I had, but look, uh, simplicity is what it always comes down to. You've just got to remember the simple habits in life, and I can I could regale some relatively embarrassing things that I think are just simple things that I forget to do, like not drinking enough water which sounds like such an obvious thing. It's part of being alive. It's what makes us, what makes us breathe and being hydrated. There we go. But look, it's, if, you, if you're dehydrated, it's going to have loads of knock-on effects. Likewise, you know, during lockdown, did I get out enough? Did I go into nature? Did I get fresh air? You've got to get all those simple things in life. You've got to go to the gym. You've got to exercise, do whatever those things are. And it helps you just function. Life is all about balance. There is always a balancing point with anything in life. Too much pain is not good. Too much pleasure is not good. You've got to find the middle ground. So if there's a stressful period in life, it's because you're doing too much of something you shouldn't be and not enough of something else. And you've got to find that equilibrium every time. So that's how I remain relatively calm, I suppose. A lot of the time when I do get out of sync, then I identify why and I just get back to the simple habits of Really simple stuff that, you you know, you don't set a clock to brush your teeth. You just do it. We shouldn't really have to set a clock to go, right, I'm going to drink some water. But we lose focus because we get ingrained in other things and, and caught up with other stuff. So, yeah, I'd, like I say, I, 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 I try and practice it all the time, but I'm not perfect. Nobody is. So you just got to draw yourself in now and again and, and remember what's important. And I suppose if you can always identify, it's like Pareto, isn't it? It's the 80-20 rules. There's 80% of the stuff you do that is, is a waste of time. If you can narrow it down to the 20% that you should be focusing on, stick to it and just do that exceptionally well and the rest of it will follow. That's really interesting. Can we just elaborate on that 80-20? Do you sort of, are you able to sort of reflect right now and give us an example of what you think is 20% worthwhile spending your time on in your business and in your job role? Yeah, for sure. So, um, uh, it would be too easy to say that the the technicalities of knowing about pension rules and lifetime allowance and um, you know keeping up with trends in the marketplace, uh, just the general noise around investments and should I be evidence based? Should I be passive? Should I be active? I would I would bucket all of that into the eighty percent. They're necessary things, they're hygiene factors, but actually they're just great distractions for a lot of people. The 20% is know your focus of who you want to work with, why you want to work with them, and then just have conversations. Don't over-rely on emails. Don't over-rely on voice notes and WhatsApp, whatever. Just pick up a phone. It's a bit old-fashioned, really. But the best way to ever get people to take action, I've always found, is to speak to them. So the 20% comes down to just knowing who you need to speak to, 
and speak to them, which sounds, again, it's really basic. It's like drinking enough water and being hydrated. But that is genuinely what it comes down to. We can make loads of excuses because I sent somebody an email, but I didn't hear back. And it's just that that's the 80% of wasted effort. And also time kills deals, doesn't it? You know, when nobody really likes their inbox, you know, it's always full up with either junk emails or things you've got to get to. It can get overloaded really qu- uh, quickly. It can be a quite a stressful place to actually go and visit. So if you're relying fully on email marketing to generate business or to generate introducer relationships or whatever it might well be, you're kind of sending something into an environment which most people find relatively annoying and stressful. And then that person has to stop. They have to read it. And if it's too long, they don't. And then also as well, they've got a reply. You know, I always love the quick approach. This is what I love on LinkedIn. I use LinkedIn all the time for business development. And I can't even be asked to send a message. I just send a voice note. Hey, how you doing? It's Sam Oaks from the Financial Planner Life. I've just had a look at your profile. Really keen to speak to you about coming on my podcast. Perhaps talk to you a little bit about some of the work I do as well in attracting top talent to your business. Loving your profile. Have you got two minutes? Here's a link to just book in and have a chat with me. And I find like the personalization of it works really well. And when you end up getting on that Zoom call, I don't even like the telephone anymore. Like it's just once mm. I get on that Zoom call, I build a relationship with them so much quicker. And no beautiful glossy pamphlet, no well constructed email, you know, no link to a um, funnel marketing system will supersede the ability to connect with somebody deeply when you look them in the eyes. And I think the dawn of video should really enhance everybody in any client facing role, especially financial planning, because the old school didn't use it. They're only not really using it. And there's only a few, you know, I'm speaking to quite a couple of young, I spent a young guy last week, actually, at St. James's place through Instagram, 200 grand's worth of business through Instagram in the last year, through face to face, straight through a system into, into straight online, you know, online, straight into a system where he's booking them in for that face to face chat. And it works an absolute treat. Yeah, I must admit, I didn't even know you could do voice notes on LinkedIn until I got your one. So uh, I haven't I haven't figured it out for myself yet or, or taken the time to look at it. But yeah, I think there's a lot of people get probably too caught up in different marketing funnels and how do I do this and how do I do the other. But I've got to say, I've, I've never spent a penny on marketing or advertising. I just ask clients for referrals. I speak to professional introducers. I show them what we can do. I I, I Actually, I actively encourage the introducer to be a client of ours first and foremost and explain to them how we work and why we do what we do. And then once they once they understand it, they can sell it far better and be an advocate. And yeah, too many people, like I say, I think in that 80% bucket are spending money on different methods of advertising, expecting this tidal wave of stuff to come in, but actually just asking for referrals. I get two to three introductions and referrals a week. And I... I I'm just having conversations. I'm not paying for it. It's just, and it's that it's, it's that momentum that you mentioned earlier. It's kind of like that mushroom effect. And the quicker you do it, one goes to three, goes to nine, goes to 27. And that's how you grow a business quickly. That's how you find more clients quickly. It's not a case of, well, let's use SEO or let's do whatever. It's all a distraction. So yeah, that's honing in, narrowing in on exactly that 20% is the simple stuff. And it's very effective. And we also have to remember that a lot of people want to use our services because they lead, they lead busy lives. You know, they're cash rich, asset rich, perhaps, time poor. So let's just cut to the facts and deal with things. You've still got to do that in an empathetic way. You've still got to do that in a way that generates a rapport. You can't shortcut that. Um, but you, you need to be quickly. You've got to expedite and get to the, to the heart of the problem and then demonstrate you can solve it without using too much jargon, no jargon, ideally, um, but just but just uh, hitting the sweet spot of what it is that they want to know. Fantastic. <clears throat> Great advice. Just get stuck in, take action. You know, you can waste so much time planning and reviewing and going into the detail. And unless you're actually speaking to somebody, what's the actual point? You mentioned there about <clears throat> introducers, introduce relationships. And within that 20% of your time, you spend that with introducers and you're asking for business. You're asking for referrals. How do you segment that then? What, what are you doing? How do you target introducers? What would be a typical introducer for you? And perhaps if someone's listening now, who's struggling a little bit with introducers, what kind of advice could you give them? Yeah. Okay. So Again, this is stuff learned by accident. It wasn't deliberate from outset. And I'd love to say and love to claim that it was, but it's not. But 
this is the whole point of this. Maybe I can help other people shortcut this journey, right? So the first thing first is that they they have to be an advocate of what you do. So I would go to an introducer and I would ask them, and I'd be interested in them and what their client base is and what what is the, what is the, what is it that's different about them and what do you show your clients, which is really value adding, because actually maybe there are opportunities I could identify for you. But if I understand more about who you work with, this could be a mutually mutually beneficial relationship. But they they need to ideally be a client of ours as well. They need to understand it. They need to get it. Um, and they've got to have their heart in it as well as their head. And then it will just flow. They become your biggest marketing support. They are your advocate. They have hundreds of people that they will want to put in front of you. And actually, the challenge becomes more so of deciding who do you really want to work with well? Who do you serve best? But you know, ways that I've found accountants, we have three accountants that introduced to us. One was just the accountant that did our company accounts and my personal stuff. Uh, another accountant I met through a finance director um, and I spoke to him about what we did. He saw a presentation that I gave and he wanted to speak to me about his own finances. That was a really easy win. Um, and then, you know, we've got H outsourced HR companies that also refer to us because we do employee benefits as well as, as private client work. Um, and it's just, look, I, I explain my story as well. I never leave that off the table. So there's not a client doesn't know about my story. There's not an introducer that doesn't know about my story. And I suppose it's that that authenticity and just the fact that I am happy to share information about myself, which means that people impart it back the other way. And you build that connection. I think the best way to ever build trust with somebody is to actually reveal personal information about yourself. And then it comes back and forth. And you not only do you actually again get to know somebody really well, that you, you've shown your vulnerabilities, particularly with what my my aspects of, of my life are. And I'm not ashamed of things to 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 tell people the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and I think that's what carries weight. And I think one of the best lessons I ever had actually when it comes to to introducers was uh, I was part of a beauty parade back in 2012 looking at awesome enrollment. When I was up against six other advisors looking for auto enrollment work. And I asked them, why did you choose me out of the others? I was the smallest company. I was the sole advisor. It was just me. I didn't have any support. And yet there could be this tidal wave of lots of lots of companies they could send over. And it came down to two things. Firstly, I didn't speak about anything else apart from the problem they wanted to have solved. So everybody else was talking about, well, we could then deal with the company owners. We can manage their wealth. They just wanted a pension for auto enrollment. So let's, let's tackle the matter in hand. And then secondly, I didn't offer to give any kickbacks. I wasn't going to give them a share of commission. I wasn't going to give them necessarily a referral back. I was just there to solve the problem. And it's all about the client betterment. If we have the sole focus of we want your client to have an excellent service, and that's going to reflect well on you, that's enough. And that's all any introducer really wants, if they're honest. And if they're asking for 25% of this, that, and the other, you're probably not a very good fit anyway. Uh, and they're probably not actually going to be as um, successful in terms of sending over a number of referrals as one that is just about the client betterment. And they will under the ones that want the client betterment are the ones that understand what your value proposition is, and they will be the ones that will identify the best fits for you. And actually, it comes to a point where you might be too busy and you've just got to turn people away, and they'll get irritated with you if they're thinking, "Well, that's a lost revenue because you're turning away things." So I, I never work with any introducers that want a kickback as well as another. Key point to it. A couple of things, brilliant. A couple of things there I just want to dissect. Um, first off, you mentioned your story. And I guess your story also was why you got into financial planning. So can we start there and just take a little look at that? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, it's a really boring answer, isn't it? Because there's not a single person you've had, you, you, you've interviewed that didn't say they didn't fall into financial planning. So, so add me to the numbers because I fell into it. Um, I left university. I went on a graduate scheme. I had my enthusiasm, enthusiasm drained out of me by by older members of teams that, you know, the old adage of people saying I'm 30 years experienced. They are, but it's the same year 30 times over. And and I was, you go into a corporate world and you meet a lot of people like that. And so at 27, I decided I wanted to do something very different. And I, I left the company I worked for. Um, I started mucking around with property in, in buy-to-lets and off-plan. Uh, I made a bit of money doing that, but again, it wasn't regulated. There wasn't a barrier to entry. And I was up in the northwest of England, and I had loads of friends that lived in London, and obviously the, the streets are paved with gold down here. So 
you've got to get here because this is where the action is, was kind of what I was told. Um, and I didn't know what financial planning was or financial advice was whatsoever. Um, day one, I expected that I'd probably have two screens, um, that I'd be trading, I'd be buying and selling, and um, I'd be thinking about equities and this, that, and the other. And it completely wasn't at all. And actually, on my on my very first day in 2007, not too long after Northern Rock had had the bank run, um, I was told that I would be doing a lot of basic things like getting people to write their will and take insurance. And actually, about a week after being told that, the penny really dropped because I connected all of that with the fact that my dad died when I was 10 and he was only 44. And the only reason why I had the childhood I had was because he had a lot of life insurance. He was the managing director of the company and had he not been the managing, managing director, he wouldn't have had that fate and I wouldn't have the childhood that I had. So after he died, I didn't get taken out of school. We didn't move house. My mum hadn't worked for years. She didn't have to go to work. She didn't have to, this sounds terrible, but she didn't have to go and find another partner and make a new man her financial plan. She didn't need that. And my life as a consequence was pretty bad because your dad's died, you're 10. And I've got two older sisters, so I was the youngest of, of the family. But it could have been a hell of a lot worse than it was. You know, money doesn't make the world go round, but it certainly greases the wheels. And it enables you to to do a lot of stuff. So, you know, I didn't I didn't actually cry for eight years after my dad died. I was told to be the man of the family and be strong. Um, and it was only on my 18th birthday, there was a big outpouring of emotion, and it was it was really, really tough. But look, I, I can tell you it's a hell of a lot worse for a lot of other people. I actually, I volunteer at a bereavement charity now. And um, I support young people who've lost parents and grandparents and so on. And the difference between my, I feel actually lucky, which is a strange thing to perhaps say, but I feel luckily and privileged for the, the outcome I had, which I trace it all back. It, it comes down to the fact that my dad had a financial advisor and he was the managing director of the company. So that is why I do what I do is I fell into it. It's not why I joined it, but it's what kept me in. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. Um, what's the bereavement charity called? It's called Stand By Me. And what do they what do they do? What's their focus? Yeah, so um they're based around where I live in North Hertfordshire, um, and Stevenage. And essentially they, they have a, a seven-week program. Um, for young children, they can be primary age, they can be teenagers, it, it varies. But essentially, it's the fact that we don't know how to grieve. When somebody dies, we don't really know what to do. Um, and everyone's experience is going to be different. But there are some simple things that you can do to help people figure things out. And I suppose, like I said, when I was told at the age of 10, you're the man of the family, you've got to look after your mum and your sisters, a 10-year-old's brain connects that to being, well, don't cry. Crying is is not something that you want to do in front of somebody else because they're going to cry. And actually, it's at odds with everything that you should do when you learn about the theory of bereavement. You've got to experience that pain. You've got to let that into your life. As hard as it is, you've got to accept that death is a final thing and that person's not coming back. You know, I, I, when I was in my teenage years, I'd have reoccurring dreams about my dad just being away on business because he used to fly to France every now and then with work. And I'd wake up in a bit of a cold sweat and think he was going to walk through the door. And your brain plays tricks on you. So it's you, 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 we have to get the young people to, again, it's, there's so many parallels with financial planning as well. I, I don't do any of the talking, which is really difficult, because um, I want to impart and let them know, I, I, this was me. You know, I'm 43 now, but you are 10. When I was 10, this happened. But I don't do that. You, you've got to encourage people by asking the right questions, but you've just got to listen. This thing is, is such an underrated skill and people feeling like they're heard and they're validated. You, I've visibly seen the weight lift off the girl who's 14 years of age. I've seen it lift off her shoulders when I listened to her tell me about her dad die. And it's really powerful stuff. So I, what, I, I would have loved to have had that. I didn't have that. It was 1990 when he died. Charities like that are few and far between. It's a postcode lottery. You're reliant upon um, mental services and child child mental services and them, you know, navigating through all of that and, and people being recognized. But I'm also a huge advocate of, look, if you stem the flow in childhood of, of pain and problems, 
you know, you you stop you stop wider social things knocking on. So if you help somebody come to terms with the fact that their parents died, maybe they don't enter into a system that could have been the route they shouldn't have gone down to, be it gangs, be it drugs, be it other things that we might rely on as a crutch to get over that pain. As I say, I'm lucky. I mean, my my outlet was that I just played a hell of a lot of football and I attached to other people. Again, you look back, I attached to my football coach, another male role models, my the, the next door neighbours, their dad, who actually died 18 months ago. And I, I hadn't seen him for 25 years, but I made it to his funeral. And I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And it's the realisation that actually I was scoring up a hell of a lot of um, pain from my own dad. And I'd never realised that I'd attached a lot to him being a sub, a sub a, you know, a father figure in in substitute until he died. And I only connected all of that because I've been through the theory of it now that I'm a volunteer of this charity. But I really want to help those children. I'm actually also the, the fundraising trustee for the, the charity. I, I was appointed that at the back end of last year, and I'm I'm trying to raise funds for the the charity. Um, so that's something else that. Is, is another reason why I want to get out there and get known. There's got to be a hell of a lot of insurers out there that should be putting their hands in their pockets to support what they're making money out of, which is people's death. So they can give it back to support the children of those that were bereaved. Guy, thank you so much for sharing that story. And you're so spot on in respect of talking and listening, because talking and listening is the thing that releases oxytocin. The oxytocin is the love drug that connects us. You turn the story that was painful into something that was very inspiring. And I can understand how if you sit in front of a client and you explain the benefits of why your father took out life cover and how that actually improved your life. And you talk about that in a positive sense, not in a way that death is something that is terrible and you can't talk about it. You bring it to the surface and the things that can be done and the way a life can be, can go if somebody protects them. And I think protection, and I hear this a lot, okay, because I do the production for the Just Covered podcast at Legal in General, and somebody I'm going to in- I've introduced you, and I'm going to follow it back up, because I think you make an amazing guest, and I'd love to get to meet you on a face-to-face basis when we record it, because your story is incredible. And I think your story should inspire other financial planners to not go away from the difficult conversation of death and life cover. Because it's the fundamental framework, isn't it? It's the fundamental foundations of financial planning. It goes life protection, pensions, investments, right? So I can understand why, if you're talking to introducers in that way, why they like you. Because you are doing something that makes a difference. Going back to the charity, and I'm on this at the moment, you're going to have to bear with me because I'm emotional at the moment. You know, I am emotional at the moment. And... um I've always tried to give back to others. I went through a 12 step process around drinking about five years ago and I gave up alcohol. And it was really difficult for me to give up alcohol. I grew up in a household with a dad who was an alcoholic, um, an enabling mother. It was very hard for me. And I developed coping mechanisms and all sorts of things. And drinking became a very easy habit to deal with my problems of the traumas of growing up in that environment, right? My dad had his problems. I don't blame him. In fact, recently, I've just got back in contact with him. And I'm so glad I have. Because your story reminds me of the fact that they're not here forever. And we need to kind of try to understand the problems that we all have and look past them. And hopefully, they, they, they change. But not to blame based on trauma. Now, giving back to others during that process that I went through has now transcended also across the talk club, the men's mental fitness charity. Because men have a difficulty, don't they, in opening up and sharing how they actually feel. And um, I've gone through it recently where I've gone through some real trouble, real difficulties, and I've lent in to other men. And and it's been so powerful to be able to share how I feel because it takes my pride away and it allows me to be vulnerable so I can start to reflect properly on the things that I can change and the impact that I've had from others that I've lent into, especially within the financial planning professions. I know a lot of people now in there and they're so welcome in it, you know, and I've just done this thing around, how are you at a 10? This is the talk club philosophy. How are you at a 10? Why? What are you doing to work on your mental fitness and what are you grateful for today? And usually at the end, you check back out again, your number should hopefully be higher. So yeah, I'm all for that. Implementing that in the process of advice is amazing. So Introduce the relationships. I can understand why you're winning them in that way and why you're getting so many referrals. Do you find that it's kind of a, an education piece when it comes to dealing with introducers? Because you said 
you almost we said like some of your clients like accountants are using your services for financial planning do you find a lot of the time they even in those positions where you might assume that they know what they're doing they actually don't or maybe they need a different perspective sure yeah we don't know what we don't know right and that's that's true of everyone and there's a lot of stuff that your accountants will do that, that i'm not aware of um i don't have to slap them around the face with it though it's a gentle conversation um, rather than challenging them directly and, and butting heads, we just need to migrate them from their position where they are to a position of being no in the no, so to speak, um, without making making them feel belittled. It's the same with any client as well, because any prospective client, if you start picking apart what they've got in terms of existing investments, you're 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 actually um, criticizing their previous beliefs and their methods of how they did things. None of us like to tell, be told that we're wrong, right? That's probably quite an obvious thing. Um, so you, you've you got to do it in a gentle way that doesn't um, upset them. Um, and I think the best way to do that is just to calmly, rationally explain how we do what we do. And then they see it all in its, in its glory for, one, its simplicity, but two, how you've made, you, you've changed their perspective and their outlook of their own financial world. You know, there's, there's so many people think, well, I should take my tax-free cash because I'm now of retirement age. Should you? Let's explore what what is it that's important to you. What's what if what are you going to do in the next five years? What sort of things might you spend that money on? Go down that path rather than well, hang on a second. Don't you know it's the most tax-efficient place you can keep your? That's just not serving anybody. It's not helping, and it's too confrontational. And it's the same with the introducers. So they do definitely think that we do stuff that we don't do and they do just think about the tools of our trade rather than actually the value that we add the conversations that we have with clients around look i use the kinder questioning when i speak to prospective clients so i i, I ask them like i shortcut and i don't actually ask the first question but i ask them if you had five to ten years left to live and you had the same resources available to you right now what would you do with your time and then i ask them if I told you it was too late and you had 24 hours left to live, what would you regret? Who didn't you get to be? And what didn't you get to do? And it's really powerful mm. because we don't know we don't have five to 10 years left to live. You know, the 14th of April next year, to the day, I'll be the same age that my dad was when he died. So from that moment on, I kind of feel like I have a responsibility to live the best version of my life because he didn't get the chance. I also have two children. So bringing it back to the simplicity of, well, why am I hydrated? Why have I been to the gym? I need to be the best version of myself that I can be, not just for me, but I mean, that is important, but it flows because then I can be a better dad. I can be present with them. Mm. I can um, make sure my health is good because hopefully if I can control some things that are controllable, my health is one. I can still get cancer as my dad did, um, but I can be around for longer and I can be a better dad. I can I can go to the football at the weekend and I can do all the things that you'd love to do with parents. Um, but you, yeah, I'm going on a tangent there, right? No, I like it. I like I love your angle and the approach to well being entwined with financial service so said you know financial well-being is such a big deal but i don't think everybody has the um ability to deliver it in a way that hits the mark i think you know you've got people going through the process of i've got to get these exams and none of that's practical and that teaches you about people and how to connect with them and how to understand them and what they're going through what what it's like to be a human because we're all trying to work that out ourselves. And I think the approach to understanding what it's like to be a human would only make you a better salesperson, consultant, or financial planner, right? If you're dealing with people on a face-to-face, -face, you need to understand humans. You're better off understanding humans, I think, than understanding every single technicality of something. If you want to understand every single technicality of something, focus purely on power planning or compliance or administration investment management you know understanding i suppose 
behaviors around their around investment behaviors and things like that. But when it comes to people and you're in front of people, there should be a huge investment, shouldn't there, in understanding A, yourself, like know yourself first before you start to know somebody else. I think that's a big thing. So if you aren't looking at getting the mirror out and taking a good hard look at why you do things, how you're affected, what are your character defects, what are your fears and what are your worries and what are your resentments, then you're not going to be able to really truly understand somebody that lies in front of you. And I think that's a big gap there. Is there anybody within financial planning, training, for instance, that might well have influenced? You said kin, uh, kinder, didn't you? Is there anything else yeah. within financial planning? And you feel free to go back to kinder if you want that has influenced that side of your ability to go out and build relationships and understand the human side of money? Um, well, I did Paul Armstrong's Inspiring Advisors, I think that was 2019, and that finessed things a bit more. And it, prior to that, it was mostly around that I wanted to protect parents and I wanted to make sure they had the, these simple things in place. But it's also maturity and personal growth. And as we get older, we... You know, every cell in your body is replaced every seven years. You're physically 100% a different human being every seven years. Psychologically, you you move forward as well. And I think what a great example of growth is when you actually almost feel embarrassed to look back at something because you're so far away from what it was that you were doing then to where you are now, you almost get that sense of embarrassment. And it, you shouldn't be embarrassed. It's just growth, and that's a great thing. We all should be looking to improve it all the time. But... um. Paul Armstrong finessed it in as much as it it brought to light the, well, hang on a second, it wasn't just the fact that I had a great childhood or, or, you know, better than it certainly would have been, and it still was a great childhood. Um, There there is the fact that there are so many people out there that aren't living a fulfilled life. And um, my my grandmother actually died aged 101 um, 18 months ago. And for the first time since my dad had died, I met my mum's cousin at the funeral. And I didn't know this till that point, but he he actually said to me that at the classic kind of story on my dad's deathbed, he, he asked my dad, was there anything you'd regret? So it is the kinder question. It is that final question. Um, and he said he wished he'd spent more time with his family because he was the managing director of various companies. He'd get headhunted and he would have left for work every day before I got out of bed. And every day I'd already gone to bed before he came home from work. So I didn't see him apart from the weekend. And then he needs his own time. We'd go and see other family. Um, And I've got two older sisters. So I'd get a third of his attention one day a week at best. So why I've got my own company or part of the reason is because I can see my kids. You know, I did the drop off this morning just before I went to the gym. and I, I, I can control my time far better than being at the the whims of a boss and a corporate saying, be here, be there, do that. But he regretted the fact that he didn't spend more of his time with his family. My, my daughter will be four next month, and I've already spent by far and away loads more time with her than my dad did with me. Mm-hmm. And I, you don't want to be on your deathbed regretting not seeing your kids and not seeing your family. I love spending time with my daughter. She's like, she makes me so happy, like ridiculously happy. I just, I'm so proud of her. And I'm so also proud of the relationship that we have and how open we are and how loving we are to each other. And to think that I would miss something like that or somebody doesn't have that because it goes by, like it goes by so quickly. I can't believe she's eight years old. These are all really interesting questions. And these are all really, you know, the whole kind of emotional subject, I think is definitely something that has to be brought into more of the, the business development and uh, side of it, especially when the products and services that you offer are actually delivering that ability to freeze somebody's time up, for example to retire earlier or to protect their family and the inevitable things that might, or the things that might well happen. So I think, you know, that emotional connection to financial planning, I think is again, so important. It goes back, like if you are considering to be a financial planner, but you're technically minded, but you're lacking those skills and you need to invest in those soft and practical skills. And these are the things that are missing from those that are coming through because they're not being taught it, you know, they're not being taught it in the way it should be taught. Um, you're almost having to either learn it from another profession and then come in. But if you're expecting to be taught that when you come in, you're not going to be. You have to either have it or you have to gain some training or some coaching 
or get on YouTube, read some books and really start to understand the human nature, understand what makes people tick and how you connect with them. You run your own business. You're also a financial planner and you take that really seriously, both sides of it. What's it like wearing two hats? What are the two different hats when it comes to running a financial planning business and being the financial planner? Yeah, it's, um, it, it does feel like juggling a lot of the time and it, it is difficult. Um, and it's only now that we've got to a size of seven as a team that I can start to hand over client relationships, which which really does cause a lot of uh, heartache for me because I've really got to understand these people at a deep level and I'm connected. But there's only so many people I can speak to in the course of a day. And I don't want to be average at doing this and average at doing the running of the business. So I've got to develop a team that can also love that client the way that I love them. And I, I, you know, I used to know every client's date of birth because I used to key it in and do all of the paperwork as well as meeting them. And I still remember probably the first hundred or so clients dates of birth. But from there, I, I lose track of clients dates of birth because that's the evolution of growing and so on. Um, Running the business, we're directly authorized, so I made it harder than it necessarily needed to be. I had been part of a network as part of the journey of 2010 to where we are right now, um, but I couldn't stand being part of a network. There were, I won't say which one it is, obviously, and stuff like that, but you know, even in the product selection and the research, there were areas of the tools in the background that were grayed out so that you arrived at a solution that had a greater vested interest for the network than it did for the client. Well, that doesn't sit with me. You know, I actually stopped doing any investment work for about seven months till I got authorized by the FCA to go directly authorized. Cost me financially, there was business that I could have done, but I just refused to do it. I just carried on doing the protection until I could get set up on in the February in 2015, it was. So that is a challenge, and it's something that I did a business management degree. It's something I, I, I love knowing about business models, how they operate. But it comes back to what we said at the top. It's about simplicity. You know, know the process. Get rid of the 80% that's superfluous that you don't need. Focus on the 20%. Focus on the relationships with the team members. So something I encourage all of the team to do, and I've, you know, we've pretty much grown financial advisors, so I've never recruited anybody that's got prior experience. And I'm not ageist. It just so happens to be that everybody's younger than me. But I like that vitality. And I think... I think one of the one of the tips I'd give anybody is never lose your enthusiasm. As soon as you've lost your enthusiasm for whatever you do, it's game over. You've got to find something else that you can be enthusiastic about. So I say to the team, look, my why is what it is. I, I cited Paul Armson earlier as somebody that kind of finessed it a little bit more and made me think about the life after death and, and the adult rather than from the child's perspective. But I was lucky, and I'd, I'd almost call it my kryptonite, that I had adversity at a young age, which taught me a lot. So even at 27, I probably had older, an older head on my shoulders than somebody that was 45, say. Mm. But And, and that, that's to my benefit. Not everybody has that life, which is a good thing, but everybody's ha probably had some pain, you know, be it that parents have got divorced. You, you mentioned your father earlier in terms of the fact that you didn't have a relationship with him and, and, him, and his alcoholism and, and how you've, you know, how that shaped you in your, your life. And actually going to the source of the pain can really help us uncover our purpose because there's all there's, there can always be a pull factor for motivation, but generally the push factor works better. So if you think carrot and stick, stick really does help quite a lot better because that pain I'm almost going into now, now how we how we work with the children when they've been bereaved. You've got to feel that pain. And as soon as you feel that pain, boy, do you get action and boy, do you get direction and you, and you start to move. And there's a lot of advisors out there that are sitting on this treasure trove of their purpose and their why, but they've not spoken about it. They've not thought about it. You know, I had a conversation actually with an advisor that I met at, at the Dimensional Conference at the back end of last year. Um and we we got talking, and it turns out that he's the son of a farm, farmer, and his parents have divorced. And I I'm really keen to find out what people's why is and and why they want to give financial advice. It was a great podcast you did the other week with Bobby Sohota, and I really like the fact that she asks people to think about their why. But I think we need to delve deeper than just why, because people will say, "Well, I like helping people." Look, most human beings like helping other people. We're human beings. We we naturally geared towards loving. 
I think, not not tendencies towards narcissism and being a horrible person, right? So but figure out what your pain point was. So the, you know, I speak to this 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 uh, other advisor, and I think, well, you don't have a niche, so to speak, as to who you really want to help and why. But let's think about their background. Well, farmers, they're probably working seven days a week. Well, that's just alarm bells of my dad not seeing him, except I did get the weekends. So if you could do a financial plan for a farmer to show them that they could afford a farmhand and they could get two days off a week, and that means that you're then liberating the childhood of their children to go to the football, to take the daughter to the ballet classes, very stereotypical, right? But whatever those things are, spend that time with their eight-year-old that they love. That's really important. And you're changing somebody's life. And this person's parents got divorced. Well, maybe they got divorced because dad was working too much and it was a bit of an unhappy household. And you can unlock all of that with the power of a good financial plan and just getting people to realize what is enough. And actually, most people die with too much. So let's not have you die with too much. Let's not fall into that category. Let's have enough, as Paul Armson would say, and let's change people's lives for the better. But if you can tap into that pain that you had because your parents divorced, that is going to send you really far. Now, I, I'm, I'm projecting too much because maybe that doesn't get float their boat. But I think there's a lot of advisors have that secret source, if you like, in their DNA, but they're just not uncovering it or thinking about it. I think you're, I think you're right there. Do you think it's because also as well, like there's a conflict between the selection of products and services that follow the actual financial plan, and that can often muddy the water when it comes to giving the advice and being authentic in the beginning. There's this thing called the Academy of Life Planning that's coming out, and it's out now. And the chap who has developed it is trying to separate the life planning away from the actual planning element away from the product selection and choice of investments. And because he believes that that muddies the water of giving the true financial plan. And he's trying to develop almost like a new role out there. So instead of like trying to get people out there who are level four qualified and going out and being financial planners, doing both, he's saying we need more people that are out there delivering the plans and removing the actual product selection side of it to be able to deliver the full plan. And you charge from that side. And then an introduction is made based on the recommendation. The recommendations are made. An introduction is made based on the needs of that life plan. Um, it's interesting because I, if I was to become a financial planner, for instance, if I was to become a financial advisor, for me, that side of it, I love. I would love to do that. I'd love to build a business where I'm. That's why I love the finance. All these financial coaches that are out there now. You know, they're doing the coaching bit. They're doing the deep stuff, and then if they uncover and discover an opportunity, it's passed over to the person who can then look at the plan and execute it. And I don't know, I just like the separation. I just wondered what you thought about that. Do you think there's so much going on in a financial planner's world right now that perhaps that muddies the water a little bit to the authenticity of the plan? I can understand why people can think that. Um, I can only speak for myself. So I know that when I'm doing things, I'm doing them solely for the client betterment. And I'd love to think that that just comes across. And I'd love to think that that would be the case for anybody that's thinking about taking financial advice, that they've got a really good bullshit detector. And they 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 will segregate those that are, are uh, interested for the right reasons and those that are. Um, yes, we could talk about fixed fees and we could have it so that it's not about incentives, about how much is invested or whatever it might be. But I think you lose a lot in between as well. So if, you, if somebody's just dealing with the plan and not the execution, and they're not seeing things holistically, things can slip between the cracks. And I, ultimately, I don't think it is rocket science. So there's no reason why I couldn't do both of those bits of it exceptionally well. And next year, we still need an ongoing relationship. You know, I say to every client, and I mean this, this is a partnership for decades. This is not a transaction. You're going to hit your peak vulnerability when you're at your wealthiest. So that's after you've stopped working more often than not. And if you're the similar age to me or younger, I may have stopped working. So why I'm really keen about building a business that actually has people that know their purpose, love the people that they work with, and just wants to provide the best service because they feel that, you're not going to do the wrong thing by somebody. Mm. It's going to flow. And everything's going to be there. And, you know, what happens if two years down the line, the person that's done the life planning 
has decided they're doing something else or you don't fit their niche anymore. Who's their relationship going to be with the financial planner? What if they're not aligned? So it is pretty simple. I mean, we can overcomplicate things. We can start talking about QROPs, QNOT. Like, it's about having the right money in the right place at the right time. That's what financial planning is. It doesn't necessarily matter what the tax wrapper is. Yes, there can be a correct answer from a tax perspective or whatever it might be. But even still with clients, I speak about the fact with any financial decision you make, there's a logical output and an emotional output. And I can't deny the emotional output. So if paying off your mortgage emotionally is better for you than putting money in a pension, that's what you damn well do. Mm. I'm not here to dictate to you what you should or shouldn't do. And I would just like to think that every every advisor operates within that um, parameter of, of just being very honest and, and doing the right thing. And look, it pays dividends because then you when when you ask them, look, you become a client. Clearly, I must have done something right. Mm. Is there anybody else that you can think of that looks a bit like you, friends, family, colleagues, that you think might benefit from the experience that you've had? They're going to refer you. And that's how you grow the business, not by just trying to put as much into pensions or whatever it might be. Good news travels. Yeah, I love it. I love the whole referral side of it. Again, like, and I look at financial planning as a profession and where would I fit in based on who the type of person I am? I love meeting people. I like building relationships. And I like the partnership side. And I think this it's wide open, isn't it, financial planning to go out and build partnerships, build relationships with community. There's so many online communities. There's so many ways a financial planner can get in to be that key person of influence within a specific niche or area. I think it's wide open. And I think as a hunter, as somebody enjoys the relationship side, I don't think I would be the person in financial planning and definitely considering the whole financial planning world, by the way, being, you know, in it for a while. But it's just, I don't want to go through all the qualifications. I don't want to do all of that side of it. And I would see myself additionally being like, because you've got the employee benefit side of your business, haven't you? And I like that, yeah. you know, the ability to go in and talk, talk to businesses and what they're up to and how they're doing things and what's employee well-being like and all the benefits of it. And, you know, if your employees were um, financially well, that would have an impact on your bottom line as a business. So what are you doing about it? Um, what benefits have you got for them? I, I, I love all that. And um, the workshops and things I could imagine like that. I would really enjoy the actual building, the build, building the, the investment stuff. I would have to hand that over to somebody else because I just don't think I've got the, um, the interest in that side of it. It wouldn't, wouldn't really interest him, interest me. Um, just interesting to ask you now and sort of, as we sort of end, come to the end of the podcast, I think mean, one of the, the areas I like to look at is what do you think, um, what do you think you're going to change? What would you like to change about financial planning in, in two, 2004 and onwards? So getting back to the, re, the, 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 the realities, the brass taxes of what a financial plan is, I think there's a lot of great work being done by a lot of great advisors with financial plans and cash flow modeling. And we are getting to where it should be. RDR has really pushed on the whole service-led aspect of it. And clients now get a far better product, or where it's a service, but they get a better outcome than they did back when I started in 2007. When we first, when I first started, we only would catch up with a client six months later to try and increase their premiums or get a referral. We didn't have any sort of method as to how we would talk about how things have moved on. Um, and it was all very immature, but RDRs really for, forced that forward. But I think people get a bit too worked up on the 80% of stuff that they shouldn't be thinking about. Um, and there's not enough protection, I would say this, wouldn't I? But there's not enough protection being spoken about. If you look at the statistics, there's a lot of people that are focusing on AUM. They want to get a saleable business. They want to, you know, extricate themselves from the business, sell it and walk away with an eight-figure sum or whatever it's going to be. But they've not actually done the basics. And if if you know if, if you could picture yourself looking at the children, looking in their eyes at the funeral of their parent that's just died, you'd damn well be brave enough to have that conversation. There's a chap I got on really well with on the podcast. And um, again, he was on the Legal in General podcast, Adrian Benjamin, um, who um, focuses purely on life protection. You know, that's his that's his job. And he's passionate about it, like you are, you know, really passionate about it. And I've got the academy and um People always ask, what's the best route? You know, should I go down a mortgage advice route first before becoming a financial planner or should I go straight into financial planning and financial advice? 
And I honestly would say, go and sell or go and advise on life protection. Get out there and smash the phones, you know, get out there and, 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 and business develop and go out there and change people's lives and understand the value and the benefit of life protection because it's only going to enhance your ability to be, deliver a full financial plan, build rapport. Because it's the, one of the hardest areas is talking about death and positioning it. And you hear a lot about mortgage advisors, you know, they don't sell it, they skim over it, they don't sell enough of it. So there's a lot of training and development. And that's what Adrian ben Benjamin is going to be doing is, is building a training and development program to help advisors and mortgage advisors how to best to position. And that's what the Just Covered podcast is about as well, is talking about those scenarios where you can do it. Um, so I think like, you know, if you're listening and you're younger or you're listening and you're new to it and you're thinking you got to go straight into financial planning, like you don't, you can go straight into life protection and you can earn really good money, can't you, in the, in a life, in the life protection world. And it is wide open because not everybody's doing a very good job on it. Yeah, so I guess, look, I, I was a financial advisor, but our focus was predominantly protection. There would be investments flow out of that. Uh, and it's only as I've got older and I've matured and I've had a family and I've bought a house and so on that you see the bigger picture and you you kind of get that experience, which helps you become a better advisor. It's probably one of the best professions there is for just getting better with age because you can't help it. You've got more wisdom. You've got more life experience. So you just naturally can impart more useful information to your clients. But I did fundamentally start with protection at the core of everything that I was doing. Like I said, it, it was a real climb down thinking I wasn't going to be trading and having two screens and it wasn't going to be this exciting, fast moving thing. I was looking at wills and protection. So I kind of did do that. But, you know, in my first year, I was number one in open work. I'd done over half a million pounds in commission in my first 12 months. In two and a half years, I did over 1.2 million pounds in commission. Um, I banked 196,000 of it. So I, I didn't get the lion's share of it. But you definitely can do really well. I think it's just got to be that it comes from an authentic, a place of authenticity of, of why and actually being, being, being caring of, you know, it's not the client that I see, it's their children that I see. But it's easy for me, I can do that because that was me. So I can see past that and I can see the need for it. And yes, it's going to pay, it's going to pay a good commission, but that is not the be all and end all. That's just the output. You, you focus on doing the right job. And you focus on having that conversation and engaging with that person. What would you? What would your family do if you died? Mm. How would your wife cope? She's not been working for five years. Would she go back into the labour market quite easily, or would she struggle to find a job? Like you've got to find a nice way of answering, asking these questions, because you can't attack somebody. But I, I, I absolutely think it's a great way for people to get into it, and I think they can earn a lot of money. And it, it, it is the foundational aspects that we shouldn't then forget because we think, well, I'm no longer a protection advisor. I'm a financial planner. Let's not get too over, over uh, like, you know, too highfalutin about it. We still should be doing all of those basics. Every client, they need their will. They need their lasting power of attorney. Have we written their life insurance into trust? Are we making sure they're reclaiming their, their high rate tax relief on their workplace pension scheme? It's really basic stuff. And that's why we do the employee benefits because, you know, this 50% of the population don't need financial advice. They, they, they just need to think about budgeting and debt. And then we're quite elitist as a profession. So we only really deal with about the top 8% of UK households. So it's about 42% of UK households don't get this information. And so the things that I would really change about 2024 not just the protection side of things, is let's serve those 42% of people. My dad was the MD. What if he died five years earlier? What if he was the ops manager? He didn't have that life insurance. My life would have been very difficult. But would he have been less deserving of that knowledge? Of course he wouldn't. So look, if I can stand up in front of a room of, of, of a company and speak to 50 people in one go, impart this basic information about don't stay in your default fund, you've 25 You've probably got 40 years to go until you can, you, you're can. you going to take your pension benefits. You've got the capacity to take more risk. Maybe you should think about moving to 100% equities. A little bit of education about what happens with the stock market. And it's not rocket science. It really isn't. But it's not taught. Mm. And it, it really should be. But it also, you've, you've still got to get people to drive and, and make that action. And I think going back to what you were saying earlier about a life planner 
separate from the person actually implementing things. You don't guarantee that the action is going to happen if you have two separate people doing it. Mm -hmm. And the action is the hardest part. Again, you could take it to the 80-20 if I keep on using this, this analogy. The action is definitely the 20%. We've got to get it over the line. It's all well and good talking about it. It's just hot air until you've got these plans in place and there's, there's the products as a result. Love it. Guy, thank you so much today for sharing your thoughts and your feelings and how you position yourself as a financial planner in this world. Really, really appreciate it. It's been brilliant getting to know you. And uh, I tell you what, if I was a financial planner or if I was in the financial planning profession, I think I'd be knocking on your door because someone like you, I think, would be not only a great leader, good visionary, but a great mentor as well. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it.